Yes, thanks, brother. We, we do have a very different culture at the point of saying nice things about people. Uh, you've got lots of nice things to say about yourselves. <laughs> we live at the other end of the world and the other end of the compliments. If anyone compliments us, we know that they are wanting something. Always put your hand on your wallet as soon as they compliment you. It must mean something evil. So, uh, on evangelism, I have three different things for us this evening. Um, uh, we're going to work through. The first one is what is evangelism, and it's uh, more of a Bible study and the turning to God's Word on that whole subject. Uh, the second has to do with a training program in evangelism, and the third has to do with the relationship of evangelism and the church. Uh, if we don't get to the third one, it doesn't matter. And I don't mind about you interrupting much, although it'll be easier to interrupt in the third one and not so easy in the second one and very hard in the first one because I talk quickly. So the first one is actually connected to 2 Corinthians 4. For what is evangelism? Let's start off there. Evangelism is evangelizing. It comes from the word evangel, which is the word gospel. It's gospeling. That's what it is. That is, fundamentally, it is proclaiming. There, there are a series of verbs that go with it, uh, saying, preaching, proclaiming, declaring. They're all verbal words, and they're all about declaring a message. That is, evangelism is not helping little old ladies across the street, especially the ones who want to go across the street. Uh, that, that's not evangelism. It, it's a good thing. It's a right thing to do, but it's not evangelism. And that you do it in the name of Jesus is wonderful, but it's not evangelism. Evangelism's got to do with speaking. It's got to do with talking, proclaiming, declaring. And because the message that we declare is divine, it's powerful. It's the powerful word of God. Powerful to create the universe, powerful to save the nations, powerful in your mouth and in my mouth if we're saying God's words. See, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we read, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? That out of my mouth can come the word of God, which is so powerful and active it can bring people to faith in Christ Jesus and go on transforming, go on being at work in changing us, just out of the folly of my mouth. Because it's the truth, the wisdom of God's word. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he speaks of the letters of Christ, the transforming change that happens in Christian people, hearing the very word of God, for they are like letters of Christ, because Christ has written on their hearts, transforming them from one degree of glory to another. It's the proclamation that changes the world by changing people in its proclamation. And to this end, the proclamation requires us to live consistently with the message we preach. The message is the message, whether we're consistent with it or not, but... The gospel is at work in us, transforming us to be more and more like Jesus, who is the very object of our message. And so the way we preach, and indeed the way we live, should be consistent with the message we proclaim. Therefore, I pick it up in chapter, two, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. But we renounce disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, 
has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The way he preaches the gospel, the way he lives the gospel, has to be the gospel. But he's not preaching the gospel by living this way. To preach the gospel is to speak the gospel. You live consistently with the gospel, well, so you should. But to evangelize means you're going to actually tell people about it. You're going to discuss it with people. And if you're going to be preaching the gospel to others, then the way you live has to be consistent with the way you with what you say. You can't have two messages, one coming out of your mouth and the other coming out of your life. That's that's not all. He preached it, he lived it, and that's what we've got to do in following his example. Now what we proclaim is spelt out for us there in verses four and five. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Now let's take those two verses. And if you've got uh, your own Bible, I'd encourage you to mark them because they're really good memory verses. And if you've got one of the church Bibles, it's better not to mark it. Uh, just, you, know, and you might, because the next person who picks it up might find it beneficial. But uh, I didn't tell you to mark it. Now, <laughs> let's take it. It's not ourselves. That is, it's not about us. We're not the subject of the gospel. We're not the important parts of the gospel or evangelism. It's not my ministry or my church or my gospel. It's not about me. For it's about Jesus Christ as Lord. And so it can't be about me because it's about him. Three things, Jesus, Christ, Lord. But actually I'll include the as as well. Jesus is that particular man of history. The Jewish man whose name means saviour, born of the family David in the town of Bethlehem. The man who went around preaching the gospel himself, the gospel of the coming of the kingdom, who was doing good, the kind of good that the Old Testament prophets said that he would be doing when he comes to bring in his kingdom, but was teaching his disciples of his imminent arrest and trial and execution as well as his resurrection, and was so betrayed by wicked men and crucified by the Romans at the behest of Jews. That Jesus we're talking about, the Jesus of, of history, the Jesus of fact. And it's the Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, Christ is not his surname. You don't look him up in the telephone book under J. Christ in Bethlehem Street, Nazareth. That's not his surname. The word Christ means Messiah. Uh, Mashiach is the Hebrew, which we kind of translate into Messiah, transliterate into Messiah. The Greek word for that is Christ. The word means anointed because they anointed kings. They still do. You don't have kings. You don't have queens. You just don't know what you're missing out. But we in the Royal British Commonwealth that we have, we have a queen. She's been around for a long, long time. But I'm old enough to remember her coronation in 1953. Ends up those who remember the coronation of the queen. There you go. Oh, well, one or two. It, it, it hits the media whenever she's around. And part of the current, I was a very, very small child. Please let this be going. And when, when she was uh, crowned, our school went into enormous procedures about what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and who goes where, and all the rest of it. And one of the things I was told is she was going to be anointed with oil, because this, is, this is, goes right back to King David and the like. And so as a small boy, I was looking forward, though a little mystified, about how a pint of sump oil would be poured down her head without ruining the dress and everything else. But that was the bit I wanted to see. And when I actually saw a little drop of oil 
it was a complete anticlimax. I thought it was a dud coronation, this one. Let's move on to the next monarch, who I've been waiting for a long time since, and I'm not so keen to get the next one anyway. She's a nice woman, the one. She's a quite a believer, actually, the, the, the Queen, and speaks up for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ very firmly of her own on occasions, which is, uh, which is lovely, actually. But uh, that's the Christ. It means the anointed. It means the king. And this one, of course, is the long-awaited king, the Messiah, that they've been waiting for for a thousand years when David was told that he was coming. And so he's accused of being the Christ, and he started to tell his disciples about his execution when he accepted the title from them. But he's not just the Christ, he's the crucified Christ, isn't he? Which is a kind of contradiction in terms. Because if you think it's bad, they're going to pour some oil on you when you become crowned, when you become appointed. Can you imagine the news that you're going to be assassinated when you get appointed? You know, come to your coronation, we're going to assassinate you. Because that was the message Jesus told, which Peter found unimaginable. This won't happen to you. Because he was not thinking the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of man. That Christ, Jesus the Christ, as the Lord. And the word Lord we don't like particularly because it means a ruler. It means an owner, a master. In the Old Testament word, uh, had the overtones of Yahweh because they didn't use the word Yahweh. They, they saw it in their Hebrew and always said the Lord instead, which is why in the Old Testament you see the word Lord is printed in capital letters sometimes because in the Hebrew, the name of God is there, Yahweh. See, I'm a man. My name is Philip. The Philip is very, excuse me, <coughs> oh, sorry about the, the recording. That's even a really bigger problem. I've got a friend in England who was nearly killed by an Australian preacher who uh, coughed and blew his nose right into the microphone. <laughs> My friend in England was driving down a motorway at the time and changed three lanes uh, without thought at that moment. How he lived to tell the story. Now, where was I up to? Well, there's one here, brother, and there's only one spot, but thank you. I'll, I'll wink when I need it up. Um, uh, the, so the word Lord has an overtone of Yahweh, of God, by his name, but it means the king, the slave owner, the master. Oh, that's a very naughty word, isn't it? Uh, politically incorrect word, isn't it? We shouldn't mention it, even though it's in the Bible. Let's cut it out. You'll get rid of that word. In fact, our translator has got rid of the word. Uh, but more of that in a moment. But it's the Lord. By his death and resurrection, he's risen to be the right hand of God, having conquered the evil one and his accusations against his people, having paid for their sins, having turned aside God's righteous anger against their sinfulness, and risen in victory over all, the King of kings, Lord of lords, God of gods, ruler of rulers. He is the Lord and master over everything in the universe. I see that you're having an election. We're having an election too. National election, like you're having a national. You haven't seen that we're having one, have you? Ah, that's typical. Anyway, you've seen that you're having one. Quite colourful one, isn't it? And I, I, I was over here some years ago and you were having another one. And uh, I noticed the excitement that came in the debates. It was uh, Clinton versus, uh, anyway, somebody that he beat, obviously. And they, everyone got very excited about it. I couldn't quite understand your excitement because it's a cultural problem, this is a difference. And a bloke sidled over to me as I was in this conference about 30 clergymen who were really getting worked up about the election. And this bloke said to me, what do you make of it? And I said, not much. And he said, no, nor do I. I said, I can't work out why they're so excited about these people becoming their rulers. They seem to me a bad choice either way. And so, and he said, yeah. He said, I'm a Canadian. <laughs> he said, we're different to the Americans. He said, the Americans vote people in, we vote people out. He and I, you see, we're both in the British Commonwealth. We know Australians never vote anybody in. We only ever vote people out. We've gone through seven prime ministers in the last six years. We get rid of ours, you see. We, you actually think that these people coming in are going to do something. We're worried they're going to do something. You know? <laughs> the last thing we want. We don't want them to make the world better. We're just assuming they're going to make it worse. So we just, we're always on the voting out. But 
who would you vote in to rule over us forever? You see, you don't do that. You've got them on a four-year tenure, haven't you? Because that's the nature of democracy. Democracy is not the rule of the people. Democracy is the rule that gets rid of people without civil wars. That's what it is. It's the best form of government that's available because it's the only form of government that enables you to get rid of your ruler without a civil war. Every other form, you've got to go and shoot them, assassinate them, or have a war or something rather than get rid of them. We've got this system devised. In four years' time, you're sacked. I think one of your contenders at the moment is very good at sacking people, isn't he? Anyway, I'll, uh, but that's, that's democracy, you see. Democracy does not trust anybody with power. That's the nature of democracy. But the nature of autocracy, the nature of rule of kings is that they have all the power. This is the king of kings. This is the lord and master over all. Yeah, but that's because he died for us and rose again. He paid the penalty for us and he is indeed our God and our maker. That is why we want to have him as our Lord. Do we really want him as our Lord? You know, the national anthem of human sinfulness that comes out of America, that has been written in America, is, of course, Frankie Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way. I've had some ups, I've had some downs, I've got some regrets, there's some bad times, some good times, but the thing that makes it right is, I did it my way. We could burst into a little round of it now, couldn't we? But no musicians, the only thing that stops us. But I reckon we most likely could get all the way through remembering all the words because it has been sung so often and so many times and in karaoke bars it is one of the pop favourites that people have to do it my way. That's the very nature of human sinfulness. And it's the exact opposite to saying, I want to live with the Lord, not me. But what we proclaim is Jesus Christ as Lord. Our Lord and the Lord of the universe. Look, let's do, just to show you that this is the gospel, flip back over to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Set apart for the gospel of God. And then he tells you about it which he promised beforehand through the prophets of the Holy Scriptures, concerning, you got there, Romans 1, 3? The gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Well, he had to be, he had to be David's son, because that's the royal family. And who was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Hey, that's the gospel. The gospel is the declaration of the lordship of Jesus Christ. The lordship of Jesus as the Messiah and King. And so you can summarize the gospel, because it is only a summary, as the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now some people preach Jesus as saviour, as if he is not the Lord. But if he's not the Lord, he cannot save you. For he saves us by conquest, conquest of sin, conquest of Satan, conquest of death. It's as Lord that he saves you. You can't have Jesus as your saviour if you don't have him as your Lord. And some people preach Jesus as Lord without him being your saviour. And you can't have that either. Because if he doesn't save you from your, from your sin, then his lordship will mean your condemnation. You can't work your way to heaven by obeying everything of your Lord. It's our Lord who saved us. So Jesus Christ as Lord is a summary of the gospel. Now come back to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. For he returns in that verse to tell you of what we do, where we fit in. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. If you're using the ESV, you'll see on the word servants, there's a little number five or some little number like that, which goes down to the footnote, designed for all people under the age of 35. 
Just a minute while I get it in clear focus here. Bond servants it has down there. Bond servants. Well, actually, the word is slaves. That's the word. But it's politically incorrect to have the word slave in your Bible anymore, so we've got rid of that. You see, you've got a politically correct Bible. You didn't know that? Well, you have. But that's all right, because slave is a slightly misunderstanding word because of the emotions connected with it. In the ancient world, there were servants and there were slaves. Servants were free to give their service to whomever they wished, and if they didn't like, they could move on to another boss and the like, and they got paid for their work. Slaves were in bond, and you can't just change your boss. You were owned by the boss in the sense of your labor was owned. Roman slavery was not the same as, as uh, American slavery or the slave trade out of Africa in the 18th century. There are quite, quite great differences between those, and that's why we don't use the word here which is there in the Greek text. It's Roman slavery we're talking of. Some of the Roman slaves were very powerful, rich people. In fact, the treasurer of the whole uh, a Roman Empire at one stage was a slave. It was a technical legal term, but it meant that you weren't free to do whatever you wanted to do. You had a master. That's what a slave had. All slaves had masters. You can only think of Roman slaves in terms of Charlton Heston rowing in a, uh, a trireme in the, and being whipped and sweat and all that kind of thing. Well, there were some slaves like that as well. It just meant, though, that you had a master, you weren't free. And so bond servants, not a bad word. You see, my wife was a slave. Uh, you mightn't have this kind of slavery in America, but we have it in Australia. Uh, my wife was a slave, and I was her redeemer. Um, I, I point this out to her from time to time. I like to mention it just, yeah, just at those critical moments when you're on the back foot, you know, and you need a bit of... Uh, anyway, I do mention to her, you see, she went through university on a teacher's college scholarship. And uh, in those days, the teacher's college scholarship meant that she, all the fees were paid and she was given an allowance as well. But after she finished, she had to work for the Department of Education for five years. And during those five years, they could send her to any part of the state of New South Wales, which is as, um, as big as Texas, um, they could send her anywhere to any country town at 24 hours notice for five years, you see. And she was therefore a bonded servant. She was in a bond. She had to pay, to get out of it, she had to pay a huge amount of money, which she couldn't afford because they kept the salary low enough to make sure she couldn't. Uh, it was the government, after all. Uh, you see why we vote our politicians out. Anyway, she was a slave for five years. However, however, there was a little couple of little clauses in there, especially designed for women, because the feminists retell history and they leave out the ways in which we used to favour women rather than oppress women. If you're a woman and you were married, they couldn't send you anywhere except where your husband was. If you're a man and you're married, they could send you wherever, wherever they wanted. But a woman, she could not be sent away from her husband. So by marrying her within the five years, she couldn't be sent anywhere. And once you were with child, then the bond was cancelled completely. Now, that was for the women. If the women had children, a baby, uh, pregnant, they didn't have to teach anymore. If a man was pregnant, he didn't have to teach anymore. He would, no, well, that didn't happen all that often, <laughs> not where we are. Um, I don't know if you've got this new method up here, but we, we fairly keep it to the women, that side. But, and so by marrying her and by making, by getting her, I was her redeemer. You see, I released her from her bondage and her slavery. Right? Now that is, that's slavery. It's, you're not free. We are not free from a Lord. If you say Jesus is your Lord, you are saying you are a slave. Because that's the other side. Of a, a Lord that doesn't have a slave is not much of a Lord. It's like a shepherd. Oh, good. How many sheep do you have? None. What well, makes you a shepherd? Well, I feel like one. You know, I mean, a shepherd has sheep. A Lord has slaves. Just goes with the territory of what it means. Jesus Christ as my Lord says something about me as his slave, which means I can no longer sing, I did it my way. See the difference? Now, it's truly offensive. It was offensive in Jesus' day. But it's true of Jesus himself. 
Go across to Philippians. Can we find Philippians? It's just to the right somewhere. I just keep turning and suddenly it appears at the top of my sheet. If you've got a telephone, you can find it that other way, whatever that way is. Those smartphones, they're so smart, aren't they? To Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this mind, 2, 5. Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. See the word, little footnote 3, bond servant again, slave. Jesus himself became a slave. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself to become obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Remember Mark 10, 44? Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Remember how Jesus took the towel and wash the disciples' feet. That was the activity of a slave. Although a Jewish slave didn't have to do that because it was considered beneath the dignity of even a slave, which Jesus did. But back to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. But what we proclaim is our, not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Whose slaves? Yours, says Paul. The Corinthians. Paul was enslaved to the Corinthians. He was living now for their salvation. He was laying down his life for their salvation. He was following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life as a slave for the salvation of other people. And so you see it in chapter 4, verse 12 there. Death is at work in us, life in you. But why was he the slave to other people? Well, our verse in verse 5, we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. Because he is the real Lord, he wants us to serve other people. That is how we serve him, by serving others. That's why we're their slaves. That's why we lay down our lives for them. It's to to please and satisfy our real Lord Jesus, who lived and died for other people's salvation and wants us to be like him, living and dying for other people's salvation. And just as he enslaved himself even to the point of the cross for our salvation, he wants us to enslave ourselves for the salvation of other people. And so it's in obedience to him for whom we live that we give our lives to others. Which is why in the work of evangelism we don't lose heart. It's why we, it's why we have denied, we've given up, renounced, as he says in verse 2, disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper. We, we don't do it in a way that is unlike the Lord Jesus Christ. That would defeat the very purpose of it. And it's why, even though we might live a dreadful life like Paul's, Back there in chapter 4, verse 8, afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted. Why it might be really difficult to do evangelism, that's all right. Because God will bring the victory through our life. We lay down our lives in death to bring resurrection life to others. We're following Jesus, you see. Crucifixion is our middle name. That's the route we're going if we're going to be in preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, the fact that you're no good at it is wonderful. It's really good that you're no good at evangelism. See, what I've discovered is two people don't like evangelism, two kinds of people. Non-Christians don't like it because we're telling them to repent and stop living the way they are. They don't like it. And Christians don't like it because we're terrified and we don't think we're any good at it. So the one thing that Christians and non-Christians agree about is we don't like evangelism. But our way is really silly. No, no, that you're no good at it is good. Because, verse 7, we have this treasure, the gospel, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 